Farm for Kaiserreich, the China update. And we're back in the League of Eight Provinces. Uh, to not play the League of Eight Provinces yet again, as the riots reach the Marshal's Palace. Now, this is going to be our second real, like, series on. What the fuck? Song Ju Yuan took over Shandong Click. That's hilarious. We are obviously not going to play as the Syndicalist Scum this time, because we played as the Syndicalist Scum last time. We played as the Syndicalist Scum last time. What instead we're gonna do is, damn, we don't we really don't have that much. What instead we are going to do is, we're gonna play down here in Guangdong. Which is hopefully going to be interesting now. General Qi assumes control. A coup in all but name. General Chen rises in Zhejiang. Oh, Jesus Christ. Obviously, we're having problems. We are having issues. But that is okay. Um, so, basically, what, I, what you've probably already seen from the title of the video is that we're going to be playing as the Guangdong Click. I'm not sure if... Uh, oh, there we go. Liang Guang secedes. Uh, silence from the south was broken this evening by a declaration from Governor Cheng Jiongming, speaking on behalf of both Guangdong and Guangxi provinces, that they have together ascended, uh, ass sorry, seceded from the League with immediate effect. The, the general denounced that the League's disregard for rights and needs of the people, and singled out the acting League Marshal for special criticism, but stopped short of outright declaring hostilities. With Anhui province already openly subordinate, up here in the Anqing clip, um, this turn of events is disastrous, and in most cases would merit a response. The news we have received by the way of Telegram from Hong Kong, which also reported the public humiliation and execution of numerous league officials in Guizhou, which is, uh, hmm, I think it's this one. Uh, it's called Wuzhou here, but I think it's called Guizhou. Oh no, there it is, Guizhou. Ha, huh, it's in Guangdong? I thought that it was farther west. Anyway, I'm dumb. Um... But exact details remain scarce. Free China! We'll start in Liangguang. Play as the Guangdong or the Liangguang. Collect. Here we are. We have a cool flag. We have some cool generals actually. Chen Jitang. Also, Jiang Guangnai. And Cheng Mingshu. Jesus Christ. We have some cool people around. Uh. And we have Chen Jiongming as a field marshal, with a big biography, because he's important. And Ma Ji, with also a big biography, because he's also important. Now, we're gonna get talking about Guangdong in just a little bit. Now, let's first set up our little country. We have two factories that can build things. Let's build in Canton, in the city. The city itself. County United Government, Federalist Model Provinces, merge all Guangdong related ideas. That sounds pretty cool. Renovate the Guangdong Arsenal. Restructure the provincial armies that removes divided military. Ah, uh, that's not good. Guangxi struggling economy, anti concessionist wave, increased factionalism. Hong Kong contacts? Hmm, pretty good. Reconnaissance training. Third Shanto Conference. Guangdong defeated Guangxi. Okay. I see what's going on. Very, very good. Alright, so... First of all... Hmm. You know, our research slot doesn't sound bad. And these things sound really good. These things also sound really good. But those are going to take a while to actually be relatively useful. So first, let's start restructuring the provincial armies. We're going to get uh, working on that in a little bit. Now, what do we get? We get either Northern School, Firepower, or Southern Doctrine, Mobility. 
Sure, let's do the Southern Doctrine, even though this is really bad. Like, we're gonna lose because of this, most likely, but let's do Mass Assault. Fuck it. Um, I suppose... Guangdong. Like, machine gun. Alright, we are in... We are in business. Oh, damn, we have 5,000 rifles to start off with. Good. We even got Veltrig era tanks. How interesting. We've even got bombers and fighters. So we are apparently somewhat technologically advanced. We've got even a even we've even got an air force, 20 interwar fighters, German planes. Alright. We are ready to go as Liangguang click. The situation in Liangguang. With the League of Eight Provinces falling into open warfare to secure Nanjing, uh, which is up here, Chen Jiaoming, our leader, the governor of Guangdong, announced the immediate secession of the province from the League. Announcing the League is corrupt and unable to protect the rights and welfare of the people, uh, he was followed suit by Governor Lu Zhongting of Guangxi in the west. Now, uh, our domain is made up of two provinces, as it has already said, Guangdong in the eastern part and Guangxi in the eastern part, or in the western part. Uh, in fact, Guangxi means the western expanse, the western plains, while Guangdong means the eastern expanse. Um, and despite the similarity in name, these two provinces are very, very different. Um, the names are probably derived from the fact that it's like, you know, a northern bias, because for centuries and millennia, the heart of Chinese culture and, uh, in general, political power was in the north. But since the Song Dynasty, which is the 13th century, this is starting to change with a gradual shift of power down to the south. Up until the modern day, when uh, the southern region really uh, starts to um, assume national level importance in uh, the political game of China. Uh, this is from the Qing Dynasty onwards, essentially. So, we are rising for our own freedom. Uh, accordingly, the Provincial Assemblies of Guangdong and Guangxi held a joint meeting in Guangzhou, uh, or Canton, which is this southern city, uh, which, as you can see, has a really, really cool uh, picture over here. Uh, it's a trading center. And, um, and uh, elected Chen Jiuming as the extraordinary governor general of Liangguang. Now, in the Qing Dynasty, uh, the provinces had uh, governors. But two provinces would have a governor, a so-called governor general, as it is translated in English. Um, I'm not sure exactly if this was um, if this was carried forward to the Republican period. I actually don't know, but you know that's a nice little tidbit. And um, while the two Guangs are united in defense against the bandits uh, in ambition, the warlords from the disintegrating league. Uh, or sorry, against the uh, ambition of the warlords from the disintegrating league. Uh, this new union of provinces is already proving to be struggling. The leaders of Guangdong and Guangxi are only united by pragmatism. Uh, the two having wildly different aims in the region, let alone China as a whole. Lu Zhongting heeds, or leads a highly militarized province, while Chen leads a varied republican coalition in one of the few functioning democracies in all of China. Liangguang may avoid the bloodshed uh, of the collapse of the League, but it will not avoid the consequences of Beijing's failure to keep China vaguely united. So here we go, we can free, we can take free things, uh, either Governor Chen will see us through, tell me more about Liangguang, or what are all these factions? Let's, uh, let's first introduce Liangguang. Um, not a question back with Hunan. Oh, here, here's Hunan click to our north. With the collapse of the League of Eight Provinces, the United Provinces of Liangguang and the province of Hunan have uh, naturally drifted together in the face of potential adversaries, or sorry, potential retribution from Nanjing. It just sounded good in my head. Uh, Chen Jiuming and Zhao Hengti are both federalists, believing in provincial and national constitutionalism and in the importance of the rule of law in these chaotic times. As such, the two have been cooperating and blah 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 blah. So we have agreed to stay neutral and support each other, essentially. Good. Um, our good little buddy in the north. Um, now, Liangguang, or Tu Guangs, is a geographical term representing both the province of Guangxi in the west and Guangdong in the east. The vice royalty of Liangguang, yeah, here, here it is calling it the vice royalty. Um, while some people call it a circuit, some people call it a governor generalship. Uh, essentially, it's two provinces put together. So, like, for example, 
uh, um, uh, there was a governor generalship of Hunan, which is this one, and Hubei, which is the province that's sort of here-ish. Um, also of Yunnan and Guizhou, which is, like, Yunnan is this one and Guizhou is this one. Uh, the Vice Royalty was first created in the Ming Dynasty, but would be dissolved and reformed numerous times until its final dissolution in 1911. Uh, its official name was the lengthy Governor General, Commander, uh, and Quartermaster Supervisory of Waterways, and Inspector General of the two expanses and the surrounding areas. Uh, obviously, because that is... No, actually, I don't think I want to do that. Because shit might happen. <laughs> what is our divisions? What are, our, what are our divisions looking at, actually? So there's the Guangxi Bubing Zhen and the Guangdong Bubing Zhen. They're the same. So, like, the Guangxi troops are over here, and that's four of them, and the Guangdong troops are on the east. Okay, and there's three of them. That's worrying. Uh, looks like the Guangxi have a bigger army. Uh, so the Guangdong province is one of the most wealthy and developed parts of China, with Guangzhou rivaling Shanghai, Nanjing, and Beijing. However, its recent history is marred with warfare and destruction pretty much since the Opium War uh, in 1841, 42, 39, that kind of period, I don't remember the exact dates, uh, all the way up to today. So basically the century of humiliation has seen Canton sort of invaded and destroyed and uh, starved a few times, blockaded many, many times, humiliated a lot of times. Um... With the province uh, losing Hong Kong, Macau, uh, and Guangzhou Wen, which is this one, uh, to Western imperialists in the 19th century, while the Xinhai Revolution, the 1911 Revolution, the Republican Revolution, eventually brought further ruin uh, by numerous wars and uh, between the warlords and the turbulent rule of the Guomindang, the Nationalist Party. Since the failure of the Northern Expedition in 1926, uh, by the way, the, the Nationalists had taken Canton as a base and moved forward, uh, the province has uh, been governed by Chen Jiangming, who was a warlord in the province who initially allied with uh, Sun Yat-sen and the Nationalists, and then sort of turned on them. In real life, this did not work out all that well for him, uh, mostly in opposition to the Northern Expedition, um, and in general to some of the KMT's sort of policies regarding central government. Um, so in real life, that did not really work out for him all that well. In this timeline, since the nationalists were sort of uh, defeated, uh, he was able to rise back to power, developing a young provincial democracy in the process. Guangxi, meanwhile, has been ruled by Lu Zhongting. Uh, let's see if we can find him. There we are. This guy. Um, who is the leader of the old Guangxi clique basically operating since 1911 onwards, and is seen as the quintessential warlord. The province has been highly militarized and the soldiers are well known across China to be some of the best. However, the high level of militarization has been costly and the wealthier Guangdong has been essentially keeping the Guangxi army afloat, basically bankrolling them, creating an interdependent relationship between the two provinces as Guangxi troops often supplement the smaller Guangdong army. What about all these factions? So basically, uh, the reason why Guangxi is so incredibly militarized is that it's uh, in a sort of troubled region. Uh, it's very, very underdeveloped, and so it's pretty far away from like the central stability of Chinese... Um, political power um, and also it's on the border with Vietnam uh, which saw a lot of conflict in the 19th century it's also at the border with Yunnan and it's in a complicated sort of uh, ethnic uh, domain there's a lot of um, a lot of people belong to the Zhuang minority the Yao minority the Yi minority and a lot of uh, and the Miaos a lot of other weird minorities that sort of exist in the mountains and hills that were pushed away from the sort of more rich, fertile lands by the Han, the, the Chinese, from the north. Um, and so there's a lot of inter-ethnic conflict in the meantime happening there. And to do that, or sort of to cope with that, the, these regions in the southwest of China sort of developed their own, like, um, militia spirit in a way. Uh, they had a lot of self-defense associations, militias that would spring up, and in times of, like, particular trouble, you know, economic hardship, bad harvests, when the state couldn't really keep control on all these potential warring factions, they would sort of protect themselves, and um, local community leaders would basically act as, like, 
sort of mayors in their own little villages, uh, leading these sort of militia organizations. And so that's why uh, sort of there was, there's a history of more militarization in the southwest of China, especially with Yunnan, Guizhou, and Guangxi, and also Hunan. Less so, but also Hunan. Um, and the richer eastern regions, a, a little bit less, although Fujian is weird as well. Anyway, well, the factionalism in Liangguang. While Chen Jiangming uh, leads a wide coalition of Republicans, the Grand Republican League, uh, it contains numerous factions outside his own political party. The Public Interest Party, or Zhugongdang, uh, was founded in 1925 by Chen Jiangming and his ally Tang Jiyao. Now, Tang Jiyao is over here. He is the leader of Yunnan, and he's a piece of shit. To, to put it very mildly, uh, Chen Jiangming is a like he's a controversial figure. He's kind of a piece of shit, but also kind of a boss. Um, yeah, I'm not gonna uh, express too much on this debate because I I need to read up on a few things before I really start to go deep into Chen Jiangming. Um, its ideology can be compared to Western social democracy wanting to improve civil and workers' rights throughout China. Mainly, however, it is most important the, the most important Federalist Party in the country, calling, calling for the central government to be organized as a federal republic and multi-party democracy. Now, essentially, this um, is viewed base like on a base level. This uh, is viewed by uh, KMT and CCP Communist Party people in real life as a uh, sort of way in which Chen sort of shows his true colors as a warlord saying that basically, you know, federalism only uh, serves his interest as a warlord to keep his own power base. And that's what, for a lot of warlords, sort of weird um, and superficial getting behind federalism and, in general, democracy meant. Uh, sort of being able to keep their own power from Beijing, uh, especially in the southern provinces. Uh, in the northern provinces, warlords tended to favor a lot less federalistic policies because they were closer to the power center and thus, you know, they would rather go for Beijing and rule. Uh, as a general rule, there's differences uh, and uh, single cases that can be exceptions to the rule. Uh, however, more pro-Chen people are going to say that Chen was actually really a federalist and like more of a idealist that was only uh, using warlordism as a sort of pragmatic way of achieving his objectives. Uh, you can read on this a little bit more. So like in real life uh, history uh, that's more connected to the two factions that eventually become dominant in Chinese politics, you know, the, the KMT, which eventually runs in Taiwan, and the CCP, which eventually ends up in Beijing and rules mainland China today, um, are very, very hostile to this guy. So most Chinese histories are not kind. While a lot of Western histories, because they want to point out the flaws with uh, Chinese governments that they don't necessarily like, are pretty much pro-Chen. So that's that's a general rule, but you know, you can get uh, you can get pretty deep with this stuff. Anyway. Uh, the Productive People's Party led by Chen Mingshu, who are, I believe, social democrats. So we, we are uh, social liberal. The Public Interest Party is social democrat. Oh no, okay, so that's like, that's the grander league. Um, wait, apparently Duan Qizhe is in this. <laughs> okay, so yeah, Duan Qizhe is not a fun person. Uh, anyway, uh, the Productive People's Party, I guess it's so, it's like the legal front of the Kuomintang, right? Uh, is essentially a front organization for the modern left, left Guomindang in, in Guangdong. So the, the Guomindang, the nationalists, are outlawed, but they have a sort of public front party, as many outlawed parties tend to do. Um, they're also social democrats like the Federalists. They differ as the PPP's ideology and philosophy is based on the free principles of the people and his teachings. So they are not Federalists. They are Democrats. They are... Um, pro uh, sort of welfare in general. They're pro-industry in general, but and they're also obviously pro-modernization and pro-nationalism in general, but they're not federalists. They want, they believe in a strong central government. Uh, anyway, um, the major obstacle in working closer with the federalists is the bad history between the two parties as founders, whom violently split before the Northern Expedition. While not a political party, the Merchants Public Safety Organization, the Mer Merchant Corps, is a paramilitary organization led by Guangzhou Chamber of Commerce. Um, led by Chen Lianbo, 
Their main goal is to protect businesses and trade from bandits and irresponsible politicians. <laughs> money, 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 and caps. Uh, they have <laughs> noticeable ties with Hong Kong, obviously, and German businessmen, making them a target of local anti-concessionists and AOG, or sorry, as the AOG struggles to recoup their massive losses from Black Monday and the leak collapse. So basically, all the people that hate the foreign businessmen uh, for robbing China of its wealth hate the merchant core for, well, be doing business with it. Now, it's interesting that in this period, a lot of like smaller, um, but also big Chinese enterprises that, of the rising Chinese capitalism uh, did get behind these sort of anti-foreign movements and sometimes even like CCP sponsored um, action. So like communists, uh, because they saw in them a way to sort of damage the competition of the foreigners that was, you know, uh, at the time, obviously, overwhelming, and so uh, they got behind sort of patriotic moves for their own self-interest, essentially, uh, which is kind of cool. Anyway, in Guangxi, uh, the provincial assembly has little but a rubber stamping um, for the army. As such, there is a little open opposition for the Guang uh, to the Guangxi clique from political groups. The clique's main enemies currently hide in Yunnan, as Li Zongren, who is a general belonging to the nationalists and possibly one of the best Chinese generals of this period, patiently waits for his chance to strike and retake the province for his own clique aligned with the right wing of the KMT. So there we go, Governor Chen will see, the, see us through. Now, I have been already exhausting my supply of time for the day, and we haven't really even moved forward all that much. I wouldn't mind some Hong Kong contacts. Um, production efficiency growth plus 30%. Hmm. As much as I'd love, see, like that's not, that's not all that good to be honest, because I'm not gonna be gaining any bloody fucking. Although to be fair, this is also uh, gaining consumer goods factories, um, which at this point I don't really have any factories, so extra consumer goods factories is not gonna hurt me either. Anyway, Governor Chen addresses the Provincial Assembly. With war and chaos raging from Shandong to Fujian during, due to the collapse of the League of Eight Provinces, Governor General of Yangguang Chen Jiuming made a speech at the Guangdong Provincial Assembly today addressing a number of issues facing the province. Chen assured the Assembly that neutrality in the, com in the conflict to the northwest was the only logical way forward. The stable and prosperous province of Guangdong needed to look inward and focus on improving the province and in the inhabitants' livelihoods. The people, oh, Soviet Russia. Uh, the people needed to show the rest of China that their provincial democracy and the civilian government was a model to follow, uh, forming a believable alternative to the monarchists in the north, the warlords throughout China, and the false revolutionaries of the Guomandang. So basically, towards a free China. Blah blah blah, anti-concessionism. So everyone's rioting in Guangzhou. Uh, we're okay with it because it's against the foreigners, but you know openly sympathize with the anti-concessionists and criticize both the unequal treaties and Beijing's inaction. Let's hope that this does not escalate. Yes, let's hope that this does not escalate and I will end the uh, first part of the Dreams of a Federation. So hopefully in the next part we'll see some action. Silence from Qingdao. Oh, despite the incident caused by the anti-concessionist riot, it appears that the German Navy is too preoccupied with the disintegration of their presence in China to single us out and retaliate. We should be safe from gunboat diplomacy from the time being. So the anti-concessionist wave, which is destroying our stability and factory output, is um, is gonna be lower. Very good. We are also going to legislate freedoms. Right? Yeah, because we do not have consumer goods factories again. Um, so. Taking this as the start to get some base stability is going to be good. So basically, let's hope that next time we're going to see some action. Hopefully, uh, dealing with some of the unbelievers in Guangxi to create a more perfect union of the provinces. And maybe we're going to get involved in the growing chaos of the League War. Especially as sort of dangerous Chen over here seems to be riding to success and is only confronted with the left KMT. Uh, but anyways... Uh, we're going to be moving towards the third Shento conference very, very soon. So, yeah. Hope you all enjoyed this sort of uh, uneventful, well, eventful, but not in the boom-boom way um, first episode. And, um, yeah.
See you soon.